Shalom, my friends. Welcome to this week's word study, where today we are going to go through the book of Zephaniah. That is, Zephaniah. Zephaniah is a name that means he whom Yahweh hides. And how interesting that is, Havarim, because this short book is primarily focused on the day of the Lord, more appropriately, as you know by now, the day of Yahuwah. A catchphrase that always refers to the seven-year tribulation, the day of Yahuwah's wrath, and is mentioned more than two dozen times throughout Yahuwah's word, seven times in this book of Tsefenyah alone. And, as we'll see through our study today, Tsefenya's name is a prophetic message in and of itself. He whom Yahweh hides. Think about that for a moment, because he whom Yahweh hides is going to mean a lot more to us by the end of today's study. The day of Yahweh, that is, the day of Yahweh's wrath, the seven-year tribulation, the 70th week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble. Through Tsefenyah, we get to view what may very well be the clearest description of this amazing and climactic event known as the Day of Yahuwah to be found anywhere in all of Yahuwah's word. And a day is coming, my friends, very soon now, when Elohim is going to wipe the earth clean. And note this, it begins with and focuses on Israel, but involves the whole world. Now, before we begin, let's bow our hearts and pitch our tents with our beloved Elohim. Dear beloved Abba Father, we come before you this day, Abba, to worship you, to praise you, and to thank you, Father, for our time with you this day in your word, thanking you, Father, for washing us with your word for causing us to grow in your word by your act of opening our eyes, our ears, and our hearts so that we can see, hear, and understand the greater dimensions of your word. As we give this day, Father, to you, Yeshua, Ruach HaKodesh, praying in Yeshua's Kodesh name, Yahuwah, Yahuwah, our Elohim, Yahuwah, Amen. So, the book of Zephaniah, it's pronounced Tsefaniah, T-S-E-P-H-A-N-Y-A-H for Yahweh, but the beginning, T-S, it's like t s f n y a so it's not just S, you, you started off with a T. Tsefenya. <laughs> the word of Yahweh, which came to Tsefenya, the son of Cushi, who was the son of Gedalia, who was the son of Amarya, who was the son of Chizkiya, Hezekiah, in the days of Yoshia, Josiah, the Melech, of Yahuda, Judah, and the son of Ammon. By taking away, I will make an end, and I will utterly consume and wipe away all things from the face of the earth, says Yahuwah. I will utterly consume and wipe away man and beast. I will utterly consume and wipe away the birds of the air and 
the fish of the sea. I will overthrow the stumbling blocks of idolatry with the wicked worshippers, and I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, says Yahuwah. I will also stretch out my hand over Yahudah and over all the inhabitants of Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, and I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place. And the name of the idolatrous Kohanim, priests, with the false Kohanim and those who worship the starry host of the Shamaim, the heavens, upon their housetops, meaning those who worship Baal, Chavarim, and those who pretend to worship, swearing by and to Yahuwah, and who yet also swear by and to Molech. Note, Molech was the false god of the Ammonites who sacrificed babies by fire to Molech, which is exactly what the Yule log seen every Christmas represents, the sacrifice of a baby by fire to Molech. And this is what gave rise to the term Gehinom, commonly known as Gehenna, the lake of fire. Gehinom is different from Hades. Hades is at the center of the earth. Gehinom is in the outer darkness, a place of absolute and complete, total separation from Elohim by request. The name Gehinom or Gehenna comes from this ancient place of burning with fire known as the Valley of Hinnom, that is, the valley surrounding Jerusalem's old city, including Mount Zion, Zion, from the west and south, where some of the kings of Judah sacrificed their children by fire a place which was thereafter deemed to be cursed. You can look at Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 31, and chapter 19, verses 2 through 6. But isn't it interesting how pretty much anyone today would say that sacrificing babies in some public place is absolutely appalling, and yet today... We sacrifice babies in the temple itself and call it abortion. Continuing, and those who have turned away from Yahweh and those who have not sought for or required Yahweh as their first necessity. Note, in other words, Chavarim, those who have not made Yahweh number one on a list of one in their lives. Continuing, hush, be silent in the presence of the Adon Yahuwah, for the day of Yahuwah's wrath is near, and Yahuwah has prepared a sacrifice and a slaughter, and has kadosh those whom he has called. That is to say, he has consecrated and appointed those whom he has called, and it will be in the day of Yahweh's sacrifice and slaughter, Yahweh says, I will punish the sons of officials and kings and all those who are clothed in lavish foreign apparel. Note, foreign apparel meaning other than the familiar Jewish clothing bearing the tzitzit, the tassels, which are Kodesh reminders for us to guard Abba Father Yahweh's teachings. Continuing, 
And in that same day, I will punish all those who leap swiftly over the thresholds of sacred places to steal, filling their master's houses with violence, cruelty, treachery, and deceit. And it will come to pass in that day, says Yahuwah, that there will be heard the voice of crying from the fish gate. Note, the fish gate, Chavarim, is the entranceway of the outer wall of Jerusalem, what we call today the Damascus Gate on the north side. You can also look at Nehemiah chapter 3 verse 3 and chapter 12 verse 39 and also 2 Chronicles chapter 33 verse 14. Again, it will come to pass in that day, says Yahuwah, that there will be heard the voice of crying from the fish gate and a howling and wailing of distress from the second quarter the lower city, and a great crashing and sounds of destruction from the hills. Wail, you inhabitants of the Machtesh, that is, those who are in the hollow or the valley of the city, for all the merchants, the peoples of Canaan, note, the peoples of Canaan makes a reference to the bloodline of the fourth son of Ham, the progenitor of the Phoenicians, as well as the various nations that peopled the seacoast of Palestine. Again, all the merchants, the peoples of Canaan, Canaan, will be entirely destroyed, and all those who weighed out silver and were loaded with it will be cut off, eliminated. And at that time, I will search Yerushalayim with lamps and punish the men who, like old wine, are becoming dense like the settling of the dregs who say in their hearts, Yahweh will do nothing. He will neither do good or evil. Note, those who are like old wine, becoming dense, like the settling of the dregs. This, Chavarim, is speaking of those who have grown old and lazy in their walk with Elohim. Those who have adopted a spiritual indifference, the inability to determine right from wrong, as we're told through Yeshayahu, Isaiah, in chapter 5, verse 20, quote, Judgment is coming to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Continuing, Therefore their wealth will become plunder and their houses a desolation, and though they build houses, they will not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they will not drink the wine from them. The great day of Yahweh is near. It is near and... Its approach is quickening. Note, Chavarim, keep talking about this thing about time being condensed and speeding up. It just keeps getting more so and more so as of late. But, um, you know, we know for a fact time is, it's not fixed, and it's not linear. It's elastic. And here we see in Yahweh's word that uh, the day of Yahweh is near, and its approach is quickening. You know, that's confirming 
that time is speeding up. And we see that in the book of Chazon, Revelation also, um, where I talk about that right up front in our study on Revelation. Um, the Greek word there is takos, has to do with the tachometer, RPMs, meaning that, um, you know, Yeshua says it and the word says it a number of times, comparing it to a woman uh, in labor where her labor pains uh, get closer together and stronger. Um, that's what's going on with time too. It's, it's, it's condensing. Again, it is near, and the approach of the day of Yahweh is quickening. Thunders and a grand proclamation. The voice of the day of Yahweh. The mighty man will then cry bitterly. And note, thunderings and a grand proclamation. The voice of the day of Yahweh. The word we see here for voice, Chavarim, is the same word we see in Yoel, Joel, chapter 2, verse 11, which is speaking of the very same event, saying, Yahweh will deliver his voice. Yahweh will deliver thunderings and a grand proclamation in the presence of his army for his machana is immense. <laughs> I'm going to the original Aramaic there because his machana. Chana? Remember that one? Pitching tense. Well, this is in Joel saying that his machana. The operation of Yahuwah pitching tents with his armed soldiers, his machana, is absolutely beyond compare. Continuing, that day is a day of wrath, rage, and fury, a day of great trouble and anguish, a day of desolation and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick, gross darkness. Yom Shofar Teruah, a day of Shofar Teruah, Yom Teruah. The alarm blast of the ram's horn against the walled cities and against the high and proud corner towers. And I will bring distress upon men so that they will walk like blind men because they have sinned against Yahuwah. Their blood will be poured out like dust, and their flesh like balls of feces. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them in the day of Yahuwah's wrath. But the whole earth will be consumed in the fire of his jealous wrath for a full Yes, a sudden end will he make of all the inhabitants of the earth. Note, Yahweh is indeed jealous, Chavarim, not in the way we think of it with our fleshy nature, but in the sense of a righteous father who is jealous about being treated in the way that he insists on being treated. Also, Elohim, of course, judges people, but let's not forget, he also judges nations. Continuing, gather together, Gather together, O shameless nation, not longed for or desired. Before the appointed time arrives, before that day is swept away like chaff, 
before the fierce anger of Yahuwah comes upon you, before the day of the wrath of Yahuwah comes upon you. Note the urgency here, Chavrim. Before the Moed, before that day, before his anger, before the day of wrath, it's like saying, hurry, 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 hurry. Yahweh has a schedule that he is keeping. The time for repentance is speeding away like chaff that is whisked away by the wind. Hurry before it's too late. Seek Elohim now. Continuing, seek Yahweh. Ask him to reveal himself to you and Make him number one on a list of one in your life. All you meek ones of the land, you who have acted in compliance with his revealed will, and you who have kept his commands. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It just may be that you will be hidden. In the day of Yahweh's wrath. Note. I talked about this recently, Chavarim. Most people think that to be meek means to be humble or even weak. Oh, the meek, you know, they're weak people. That understanding could not possibly be further from the truth. This English word we see is meek often seen in our Bibles, is an English translation of the Greek word praus. And praus is a word used by horse trainers in referring to a very exceptional animal, who being much larger and mightier than his master, able to do as he pleases, just like us chavarim with our free will. But even so, a horse that is meek, a horse that is prowess is a horse that controls himself and not only obeys the voice of his master, but obeys no other voice but his master's. For us, that speaks of those who have enough of the filling of the Ruach HaKodesh that they have self-control and they are seeking Yahweh and they are seeking meekness, the ability to control themselves in order to do what's right, according to Elohim, rather than what pleases them. Also, we just read, it just may be that you will be hidden in the day of Yahweh's wrath. Here we want to take a look at Yeshayahu, Isaiah chapter 26, verses 19 and 20, which read, My dead body will rise. Note, Yeshayahu knows that he'll be dead by the time the Nechetef, the rapture, happens. My dead body will rise. You who lie in the dust, Awake and shout for joy, for your dew is a dew that is celestial and supernatural. It is the light of joy, the light of Chedwa, and the earth will give birth to the spirits of the dead. Come, my people, this is Isaiah now, come, my people, enter your rooms and shut your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until Yahweh's wrath is past. What? Enter your rooms and shut your doors behind you? Could these rooms be the same ones that Yeshua told us he was preparing for us in Yochanan, John chapter 14? I go away, it's to prepare a place for you, that you may be with me. 
so that we may be hidden in the day of Yahweh's wrath? Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, is also known as Yom HaKaseh, which means the hidden day. And Chavarim, the entire concept of the called out ones, was hidden throughout the first covenant books, as Shaul, Paul, expressly points out in Ephesians, Ephesim, chapter 3. And now, here in Sephinia, we are being told again, seek righteousness, seek meekness to control yourself so that you listen to no voice other than Elohim's, so that you obey no commands but Elohim's, because it just may be that you will be hidden in the day of Yahweh's wrath. And Sephinya, his name, means he whom Yahweh hides. Continuing, now hear the fate of the Philistines. Gaza will be forsaken and Ashkelon will be left in ruins. The people of Ashdod will be driven out at noonday and Ekron will be uprooted. Note, we can look at Gaza today, my friends, and clearly see this prophecy fulfilled. Gaza is a forsaken place today. And the present Ashkelon is not over the ruins of the old city. It's closer to the coast and is a place of ruins. Continuing, Woe to the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Kerethites, the word of Yahweh is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. I will destroy you, and no inhabitant will be left. Note, there are no Philistines left on this earth, Chavarim. The word Philistines is where the word Palestinians comes from. But, Palestinians are not descendants of the Philistines. They are of Shem, not of Ham. And, interestingly enough, the meaning of the name Palestinians is something like, we're just passing through, we don't own this place. <laughs> Did anyone ask if Yahweh has a sense of humor? <laughs> he does. <laughs> Continuing, and the sea coast will be pastures, and meadows for shepherds, and pens for sheep. The sea coast will belong to the remnant of the house of Yahuda. They will pasture their flocks upon it. There in the house of Ashkelon, they will lie down in the evening, for Yahweh, their Elohim, will care for them and restore them from their captivity. I have heard the scorn of Moab and the insults of the children of Ammon, by which they have disgraced my people, bragging exaggerating, and making threats against their land. Therefore, as I live, says Yahweh of armies, the Elohim of Yisrael, Moab will become like Sidom, Sodom, and the children of Ammon, like Amarah, Gomorrah, a land possessed by nettle weeds and salt pits, a place of perpetual desolation. The remnant of my people who escaped will seize and plunder them, and the survivors of my nation will inherit their land. Note, if we look back at our study of Genesis, Bereshit, chapter 19, Chavarim, Lot's daughters, fearing a lack of offspring, got Lot drunk, had incest with him, and it is their illegitimate 
incestuous offspring that became Moab and Ammon. Further, throughout history, not only have the descendants of Moab consistently opposed Israel, but once famous for its fruitfulness, today is completely barren, the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan, which is, by the way, a place that escapes the stronghold of the Antichrist and provides a place of refuge in Petra for the 144,000 Jews of Revelation 7 and 14. Continuing, this is what they will get for their pride. This is what they will get for taunting and for magnifying themselves against the people of Yahweh of armies. Yahweh will be awesome to them, for he will starve all the false gods of the earth, and men will bow down and worship him, every one from his place, even all the isles and coastlands of the nations. You Cushites, Ethiopians, also, you will be slain by my sword. And Yahweh will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Ashur, Assyria, and will make Nineveh a place of desolation as dry as the desert. Note, back in the days of Tsephaniah, anyone reading this would have thought this was crazy. Assyria had ruled the known world for several hundred years. And Nineveh, which we first saw in our study of Genesis chapter 10, was the headquarters of Nimrod. Both gone. Continuing, flocks and herds will lie down in the midst of Nineveh, all the wild beasts of the nations of every kind, both the pelican and the bittern, will lodge on the upper part of her fallen pillars. Their calls will echo through the windows. Rubble and drought will be in the doorways. For her beams of cedar, Yahuwah will expose. This is the carefree city that lived in safety, who said in her heart, I am all. There is nothing but me. What a desolation she has become, a place for wild beasts to rest in. Everyone who passes by her will hiss and shake their fists at her. Woe to her that is filthy and defiled, the oppressing city, meaning Yerushalayim, Jerusalem. She did not listen to or heed the voice of Elohim. She accepted no correction or instruction. She placed no trust in Yahweh, but instead was confident in her own wealth. And she did not draw near to her Elohim. But instead, she drew near to Baal and Or Molech. Her officials are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw no bones on the morrow because nothing is left by the morning. Her Nevi'im, her prophets, lack truth and are reckless, treacherous men. Her Kohanim, priests, have polluted and profaned the Mishkan sanctuary, defrauding Elohim and man by pretending their own word is Elohim's word, they have done violence to the Torah. Note, anyone does violence to the Torah when they teach it wrongly or when they superimpose their own doctrines into it or when they ignore it and fail to teach it at all. Continuing, Yahuwah is uncompromisingly righteous in her midst. He does no wrong. Morning by morning, he brings his justice to light 
in every new day. He does not fail, and yet the unrighteous have no shame. I, Yahuwah, have cut off nations. Their battlements and corner towers are desolate and in ruins. I laid their streets waste so that none passes over them. Their cities are destroyed so that there is no man. There is no inhabitant. I said to her, meaning Jerusalem, only worshipfully revere me. Receive correction and instruction, and your dwelling will not be cut off. However, I have punished her according to all that I have appointed concerning her in the way of punishment. But all the more, they've been eager to make all their doings corrupt. Note, contained in the following verse, and that is verse 8 of chapter 3. Every single one of Yahweh's odiot are displayed. Continuing. Therefore, earnestly wait for me, declares Yahweh, for the day when I rise up to attack my prey, that is, to attack as a witness, as an accuser, and as a judge. For my decision and determination, and my right it is, to gather the nations together, to assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them my indignation, yes, even all the heat of my fierce wrath. For in that day, all the earth will be consumed by the fire of my intense jealousy. Again, Chavarim, in the verse I just read in Yahweh's original Aramaic Hebrew text, he listed every one of his odiot, including the five final forms, and then he turns from the judgments to the kingdom blessings. Continuing, for then, changing their impure languages... Should I repeat that? <laughs> changing what? Oh, changing their impure languages. I will give to the people a clear and pure speech from pure lips so that they may all call upon the name of Yahuwah to serve him with one unanimous consent and one united shoulder bearing the yoke of Yahuwah. Note, what's a yoke? I'm surprised how many people aren't familiar with that, and yet... Why would anybody be? Farming is a thing of the past, but you picture two oxen. And they have to be paired properly and positioned properly because one of them is a leader, the other one's a follower. And if you don't know what you're doing, they'll like to fight against each other. But you have two oxen, and uh, there's a yoke. A yoke is a. Um, a uh, piece of wood goes over the back neck of one over and then up over the back neck of the other oxen with a hoop under each one of their necks so they're both hooked together. And, you know, we talk about this with the odiot all the time. Uh, the first oat, olive, has to do, it's a picture of an ox head, has to do with being yoked to Abba, Father, Yahweh. There's, you know, a connection there. So, here he's saying he's going to give everyone a pure lip to speak, a pure language, so that they will serve him, Yahweh, with one unanimous consent, one united shoulder bearing the yoke being yoked to 
Abba Father Yahweh, and taught by him. Note, <laughs> bearing the yoke of Yahweh, being yoked to Abba Father Yahweh. Personally, Chavarim, I am convinced that Yahweh's imparting this clear and pure speech is a matter of his imparting to us his original Aramaic Hebrew tongue, pure and clean as it was in the very beginning. Continuing, from beyond the rivers of Cush, Ethiopia, my worshippers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, will bring and present my offering. Note, in 1991, the world witnessed a record-making event in a matter of just 36 hours. 14,000 Ethiopian Jews returned to Israel. Continuing, in that day you will not be put to shame for all your deeds by which you have rebelled and transgressed against me. For then I will take away out of your midst those who rejoice in prideful ways and never again will you be haughty or arrogant on my Kodesh mountain. For I will leave in the midst of you a people afflicted and poor who trust in and seek refuge in the name of Yahweh. And the remnant of Yisrael will do no unrighteousness. They will speak no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they will shepherd their flocks and make their rest with no one to frighten them. In that day, shout with joy, O daughter of Zion! Shout, O Yisrael! Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Yerushalayim! Because then it will be that Yahweh has taken away your judgments, he has cast out your enemy, the Melech of Yisrael, the King of Israel, Yeshua HaMashiach, Nagid, Nagid, the King of Israel, the Melech of Yisrael, even Yahweh himself, is in the midst of you, and after he has come to you, you will not experience or fear evil ever again. In that day it will be said to Yerushalayim, Do not fear, O Tzion. Do not let your hands hang limp. Yahweh, your Elohim, is in the midst of you, and he is the mighty one who saves. He will delight over you with chedwa joy. He will rest in silent satisfaction, and in his love he will be silent, making no mention of past sins. And he will rejoice over you with singing. I will gather those belonging to you who yearn and grieve for my Kodesh appointments to whom the shame and disgrace of it was a burden. At that time, I will deal with all those who oppressed you. I will save the lame and gather those who were cast out and will get them praise and fame in all the earth where they were put to shame. At that time, I will bring you in, yes, at that time I will gather you, for I will make you a name and a praise among all the nations of the earth when I recompense your captivity before your very eyes, says Yahuwah. <laughs> and that's our study. Let's bow our hearts. Oh, Abba, Father, 
We praise you and we thank you, Father, for our time with you this day. We praise you and we thank you, Father, for watching over the seeds that you have planted in our hearts this day, causing them to take root in us, causing your word to grow in us, Father, in new and mighty ways. As we give this day and every day, Abba, Father, Yahweh, to you, your beloved Yahid, Yeshua, and your indwelling Ruach HaKodesh, praying in Yeshua's Kodesh name, Yahweh, Yahweh, our Elohim, Yahweh Echad. Amen. Well, there we have it, my friends. As always, I hope and I pray that today's study is a mighty beracha to you and yours, Abba willing. I'll see you here again next week. Until then, Shalom Chavarim. Some would rather let it lie, but the question still remains.